Hello everyone, what's up? Gustavo here. Today, I want to discuss something super interesting, which is this relationship between simulation of movement, right? If you have a physics engine, if you have a game, simulation of movement and fundamentals of calculus. Because one of the easiest ways of us understanding calculus is looking at physics and how it relates to mechanics, right? Movement of objects, velocity, acceleration, and change in position. And for us to start this conversation, I'm going to do a very quick introduction, very, very basic, just touch and go in this fundamental 101 ideas of calculus. And trust me, this topic is super fun. So without further ado, let's get this going. We're going to start our conversation thinking about how we approach these ideas of physics simulation. So if you have a game, if you have a physics engine, the way that we do things is we have everything in this game loop, frame per frame being displayed, right? We have this step-by-step -step simulation. And whenever you are updating your objects, everything is happening inside this game loop, which is being processed frame per frame. Right? Or, in our case, simulation step by simulation step. So you have this discrete step by step processes that is going to update the position, render update, velocity, acceleration, position, rendering objects. This is what we usually call game loop in the context of games, or I'm going to call it the physics step. Right? We have this physics simulation step in our engine. So this is the context that we are dealing with. Right? And I wanted to remember also something super important, which is in our update of this step-by-step -step discrete physics simulation, our update, we have this concept of what we call the delta time. And the delta time is this calculation of the time that elapsed from the current frame that we are and the previous one. How long in seconds since we executed the last frame or the last physics simulation step of our program. So as you can see here, a very high level overview, the delta time is going to be inside our update, our step-by-step -step update, and is going to calculate the current frame that we are right now minus the milliseconds of the last frame. And this difference is going to give me this delta time, this difference between time between this current frame and the previous one. So just putting things into context because this delta time is going to be super important for us whenever we are going to talk about calculus now. So let's start our conversation, our nerd conversation, about these ideas of uh, continuous nature of functions and discrete nature of functions. Right? If you ever took a course on calculus, you will know that calculus is that area of mathematics that deals with mostly continuous function, right? So uh, interpreting the rate of change of continuous function. And whenever we talk about continuous functions, we are talking about whenever we look at mathematics, right? Whenever we look at a function that goes from the real numbers to the real numbers, the real numbers, they are this continuum, right? There are no holes in the real number line. So it doesn't matter how much you zoom, there is never holes there. And then that is what we call a continuous, right? These ideas of infinity, it is a continuous. And we are usually used to deal with these mathematics functions, right? These mathematical functions as this continuous, right? So quick example, right? If you plot the position of an object as it falls down, right? Let's say it falls down 9.8 meters per second per second, right? 9.8 meters per second squared. This is an object under constant acceleration. We are just falling, right? An apple is falling down at a constant acceleration. If you plot the position P, and forgive me, I'm using P as the letter for position here in this case, I think it makes sense. So the position P and this timeline, right, uh, across time, this is the movement that we see. This thing right here, we usually look at this from a pure mathematical point of view. This is a continuous function, right? And then we also have to remember that in the real world, right? Actually, in the applied mathematics, whenever we are talking about software, whenever we are talking about our software simulation, for example, we don't have continuum, right? We need to transform that thing into discrete step, step by step in the discrete fashion. So you will end up with something like this, right? We are going to sample our position of our object at discrete intervals, right? So we have at one second, the position is there, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, so it is discrete. 
I am just explaining this difference between continuous and discrete. Look, this discussion is not trivial, right? The real world, right? You're going to say, okay, Gustavo, what about the real world, the position of an object in the real world? Is that continuous or is that discrete? And look, this question, is the real world continuous or is the real world discrete? It is not a trivial question at all. It is not a very easy question to answer either. There are several people across several centuries that have been trying to answer this question. Historically, we usually looked at the real world as continuous, right? We always thought that it was continuous. But then we started dissecting the problem and then we saw that, for example, matter, right? The idea of matter, these objects, if we start really zooming in and looking at the properties of the particles and the atomic properties of atoms, electrons, quarks, it looks like we are dealing with a discrete problem, right? Whenever we talk about matter. And you will be surprised that studies would claim that the fabric of time is actually discrete in nature, right? For everyone's surprise, right? If you are a human being trying to reason about time, we think continuous, but if you really dissect and you try to understand these ideas of dimensions and really high-level physics, it looks like it is discrete as well. But going back to our simulation and our software simulation, we are going to deal with these ideas of pure mathematics, continuous functions, and discrete. And if you ever took a course on calculus, right, if you looked at the definition of calculus, which originally was called infinitesimal calculus, calculus is the study of continuous change. And again, we are looking at a function that is continuous in nature, and then we want to understand what happens to this function what is the rate of change of that thing, right? So if the velocity is changing, if we are increasing the velocity at each one of these time intervals, how is our speed, right? This instantaneous velocity. What is the speed at a certain time of this graph, of the position through time? Calculus is this study of continuous change, the rate of change, these ideas of continuous, right? These functions that are continuous in nature, we want to do some analysis and understand how do we compute, how do we get actual mathematical solutions out of this continuous change. This analysis of continuous change of continuous function, right? This is calculus. And then we go, we spend an entire semester learning about calculus, we spend an entire semester deriving the formula to understand this relationship between change and this infinitesimal values. But let's just do a quick 101 review of what calculus is really about, right? And I'm not going to attempt to do a full comprehensive review of calculus, it's just a touch and go so we are in the same page. So, calculus. If I ask you this question, right, what is the rate of change of the position at a time 4.264 seconds. So right about here in the timeline, I want to know what is the speed, right? So what is the rate of change of the position? Meaning, what is the slope, right? What is the inclination of that function at that specific time right there, 4.264 seconds? This is a very classic calculus question, right? So what is the rate of change at that particular moment in time? And to understand this thing, right? Whenever we, whenever back in the day, whenever they started to reason about this problem, one way of approaching this problem was this. Well, if we look at this function right here, and this is under the umbrella of what we call differential calculus, right? So if we look at this graph right here, look at what it says, we can estimate the rate of change between two time intervals. So if I have time interval t4 and t5, I can basically do some estimation. I can get the start t4, the end t5, and then look at that slope, look at that rate of change between those two values. And I can do the same thing for all these time intervals between t1, t2, t2, t3, t4, t5. So I will end up with all this approximations, right? These estimations between t5 and t6, I would say that it is the slope right there. So we are basically just estimating using these discrete values. But do you agree that the bigger the interval that we have, the more is going to be our error, right? We are not going to be that accurate whenever we have this big interval right here, because that function is continuous. We are basically doing this discrete analysis, the end 
minus the start, get the slope between those things. This is an estimation of that slope. And look at what I'm saying. I wanted to already create some intuition between time interval that we are taking this estimation and the delta time that we spoke before, right? Always remember about the delta time that our simulation is running step by step. So this is what we have right now. We can estimate that slope, that rate of change, by analyzing this time interval. The first between the second, right? And the second, the third, the third, the fourth. This is an estimate. We can also think that if I go and I reduce my time interval, right? If I just squeeze them a lot, the less the time interval, the better is going to be my approximation, my estimation. So what if we make this interval smaller and smaller, right? Very, very small. That will increase our estimate, uh, the accuracy of our estimate, and we will basically tend to the correct slope, right? To the tangent of each one of those values. So the rate of change, we are getting better and better because we are reducing and shrinking this distance, this time interval delta time that we have. Shrinking a lot and a lot more until we reach this image right here, which is basically the fundamental idea behind what calculus is really all about. What if we squeeze and shrink those time intervals, those delta times, pushing them to the limit as it approaches zero? Right, so calculus is all about these limits. What if we go and we shrink them? And what if they are smaller and smaller until the limit approaches zero? The size of those time intervals approaches zero. That will get us closer to a perfect result, right? For the rate of change at that particular time that we want to find out. That is the slope, the rate of change of the position through time. And this thing right here, this is what we call differential calculus. And intuitively, only by looking at this image and understanding the background that I just gave you, it is clear that the smaller the delta time of our simulation, the more accurate is going to be our estimation of the position of the velocity in our physics simulation. Does that make sense? So this is something super important. The bigger our interval of time, right? the more we wait between the last frame and the current frame, the more we're going to have errors in our estimation, in our integration of the position, to find the new position where the object should be, to find the new velocity where the object should uh, go and move. These things, the bigger the interval, the more we have errors in our estimation. The smaller our delta time of our simulation, the more accurate we're going to get and the smoother we're going to get and perfectly fit into our continuous function that we were really trying to find in the first place. All right? So this is these ideas of differential calculus. And there is also something called integral calculus. Integral calculus is part of the same set of problems, right? It is part of calculus, but the question that we ask is a little bit different, right? So in integral calculus, we have this continuous function, and the question is, how do I find the area under this function curve right here? So if I want to find the area, right? The area under this curve right here, the value out of the area of this curve, how can I find that? And you probably already have some idea of how we are going to approach this problem, right? Integral calculus, a little bit different. We can just approach the problem in a similar way as before. So we know we can estimate the area of those rectangles that are under the curve and between two time intervals, right? So again, if I have these time intervals, what if I come here and I just draw this is under approximation under the curve. What if I just put some rectangles? Well, I can just add the area of those rectangles and then that will give me some very bad approximation, but it is an approximation of the area under the curve. And you probably know where we're going with this, right? What if we make those time intervals really small, right? What if we make the intervals smaller and smaller? That will increase the accuracy and the estimate, right? The prediction of the correct total area under the curve. Same thing, so this is a lot better than before. Still, we have some errors in the calculation. It's not the perfect solution, but we are getting there, right? As smaller we have these time intervals, our delta time, the more we can understand about the area under the curve. And it comes as no surprise that if we want to get a perfect fit under the curve, what if we squeeze and we shrink those time intervals, those delta times, as our limit approaches zero, right? The width of those rectangles approaches zero. 
that is going to get us closer to our perfect fit for the area under the curve. This is what we are seeking, right? And if you ever took calculus in college or university, we spend one semester looking at different functions, understanding the mathematical and the numerical way of solving the integral of these functions or the differential of the function. So it's all about rate of change, it's all about the area under the curve, integration and derivation, right? We have these two big things, differentiation and integration. These are probably the two biggest areas of calculus. And if you ever study calculus, you probably spend a lot of time with differentiation and a lot of time with integration, right? These two things. Gustavo, why are we talking about calculus if we're talking about simulating, right? Physics, engines, games. If you want to talk about real-time simulation, why are we going on this tangent <laughs> and talking about calculus, right? So here's the thing. A physics software simulation, it works by making several small predictions based on the laws of physics, right? What that means is we perform predictions using this mathematical tool and technique called integration, right? Integral calculus from before, the area under the curve, we're going to use something called numerical integration to create these predictions of where is the object position going to be the smaller the delta time, as you just saw before, the smaller the delta time of our physics step by step, the better is going to be our prediction, right? The, the bigger the delta time, the more we wait between this step by step simulation uh, increments, the more is going to be our error, our prediction. So this is what I'm saying, right? If we are in this frame, so the object that we are trying to study, it is in this position and it is traveling this fast in this direction. So in a short amount of time, this object should be over there. And so that is what we usually deal with this physics simulation. And this is happening, this question is happening frame by frame, step by step of our physics simulation, right? If the object is in this position and it is traveling at this speed, at this direction, we do this prediction and we predict, we estimate that the object position is going to be in this position right here. This is what physics software simulation is all about, this prediction, because we are dealing with this discrete step-by-step, frame-by-frame simulation via software, right? Everything is discrete. We don't have this function that is continuous. We basically have this estimation to find the rate of change, and then based on that estimation of the rate of change, we go and we update the position of the object. This is what, that is the relationship between what I just explained before during this calculus very quick review and what we're dealing with here. So let's start talking about differentiation, but in the context of movement, right? Because I want to look at those functions of movement, position through time, velocity and time, and I want to put them in this context of calculus, the rate of change, the analysis of what is happening time per time with that slope, the rate of change of the position across time. So if we have an object position across time, if that object is falling at a constant rate, right, constant acceleration, again, 9.8 meters per second per second, this is usually the graph that you're going to see, right? This is the position of that object across time. So the question is always, right, at that particular time, what is the rate of change that particular time t that I want? That is going to give me a little, we want to find the tangent, right? The little slope at that particular point in the function. So if we have a function graph of position versus time, we can get the velocity of that movement by differentiating the position at a certain time t that we're looking for. Look again at what this is saying. Differentiation, right? Finding the rate of change, the slope of the function, means finding the velocity, right? So we are basically finding the speed, the velocity of an object at a specific time of that continuous function. This is calculus, and this is calculus being applied in the context of mechanics, movement, right? This is super important. The differentiation finds that rate of change, the slope. And let's go even further, right? You will see that in the mathematics notation, we say that V equal to dP over dt. So 
the difference of position, difference of time. I look at this dt, pay attention to what this dt right here means in this mathematical notation. dt is our delta time, right? If we do this link between our physics simulation. So in mathematics, we usually use this dt right here. I wanted to start thinking about this dt as that delta time. Of course, as the limit approaches zero, we get our perfect solution, the perfect slope of that rate of change, our velocity. And you will usually see people say that the derivative of the position is velocity. The first derivative of the position is the velocity, which in my mind makes perfect sense, right? The rate of change of the position through time is the velocity of an object. Good stuff. We can even go further. What if I analyze the velocity through time? So this is what happens to the velocity. The velocity in a constant acceleration, the velocity changes linearly, right? The velocity increases as time goes by. So if I plot now the velocity v through time, I'm going to understand that I want to find what is the rate of change of the velocity at a certain position. So if I differentiate again, I'm going to find the acceleration. But we all agree that since we're talking about a linear function, there is no actual, the rate of change is constant throughout the function, right? There is no change in the rate of change. So the rate of change of the velocity is constant. And this doesn't surprise me at all, because since we are talking about constant acceleration, this problem of an object falling, it is falling under a constant acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second. So if we have a function graph of velocity cross time, we can get the acceleration of that movement by differentiating the velocity at a certain time t that we want. So these things right here, if we look again at the mathematical notation, the acceleration, it is the derivative of velocity to time. So the derivative of velocity is acceleration. The derivative of the position is the velocity, and the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. And I wanted to read this as the rate of change of the position is velocity, and the rate of change of the velocity is acceleration, how much the velocity is changing per unit of time. Good. And I can even go and look at now the acceleration, right? But since we know the acceleration is constant, right? Our little, in our ex example, our acceleration is constant 9.8 meters per second squared. So I want you to pay attention to the flow that we are doing things. This is what we call differentiation. We are creating this derivative, we are finding the derivative of the functions and we are going this way. So we start with the position and to find the rate of change, to find the velocity of that object, I differentiate the position and I find the velocity. And it, if I have the velocity and if I want to find the rate of change of the velocity, I differentiate the velocity to find the acceleration. In our case, acceleration is constant, but I think it makes sense that we go from this thing, rate of change, is the velocity, rate of change is the acceleration. This here, in this way, we are differentiating these functions, right? And this is super important because what if we want to do the other way around? So I want to analyze now the idea of what we call integration, which is going from the other side. What if we want to find the velocity based on the acceleration? And what if we want to find the position based on the velocity? differentiation, we started with the position, and then we found the rate of change, which was the velocity, and then we found the rate of change of the velocity, which was the acceleration. Now we are going the other way. If we know that our acceleration is constant, how do we get the velocity, right? How do we integrate and get the velocity based on this information? We go and we look at that area under the curve, right? Area under the function. This thing right here, we are going to understand that by integrating this function, we end up with these ideas of the velocity. So if you look at the actual function, this constant, if you integrate, you're going to get this new function, which is the velocity. And in this case, it's going to be a linear function. So after we go and we integrate this function, which is constant, we end up with this linear function. And if you ever took calculus and you try to get the integral of a constant, you end up with a linear function, right? I hope this 
all kind of rings a bell. If you ever studied calculus and you have those formulas of what does it mean to have an integral of a constant? What does it mean to differentiate a constant? Those things, they all link back to this intuition that we're trying to create here. So I go from acceleration and to find the velocity based on the acceleration, I have to integrate my problem. That will give me the velocity. So we usually use this notation. We say that the velocity is the integration of the acceleration at that dt, right? So we integrate the acceleration to find the velocity of our problem, right? A velocity at a certain time that I want. This is integration, right? This is the idea of Riemann sums right here. And we can even go further. So now that we have this function for the velocity, right? And the velocity increases linearly as time goes by. If I go and I integrate this thing again, I will find this area right there, right under the curve. And we know that if we integrate, we're going to end up with that function right there of the position through time. And then we say that position is the integral, right? It is the integral of the velocity dt. We integrate the velocity to find and estimate and predict the new position that we need to find. Look, this is super important. We want to go this way, right? We have an acceleration value. How do we find the new velocity? We integrate the acceleration to find the velocity. If we have the velocity now, how do I estimate the new position of that object? I integrate the velocity to find the new position. And this has everything to do with these two lines of code that you can see here inside our update function. If I have the acceleration, how do we find the new velocity? This is what we call integration, right? This is one way of integrating and finding the new velocity based on the acceleration and finding the new position based on this velocity that we just found above. These two lines of code where we are finding the velocity and the position based on that velocity, this is us integrating our problem, right? We start with this constant acceleration, we go and we integrate to find the velocity. And then now that we have this new velocity, what is the new estimated position of the object? I integrate to find the position, right? I integrate the velocity to find the new position. I know that it's all this discussion that we spoke about the fundamental of calculus, limits, shrinking the delta time, everything boils down to this discussion that I just had in those two lines right there, right? This is what we call Euler integration is one of the simplest ways that we can go and integrate the acceleration to find the velocity and integrate the velocity to find the new position of the object, right? To predict the new position of that object. And this Euler integration, is just one example of how we can approach this integration. But it is very good for physics simulations. It gives some good results, some good predictions. And this is what we're going to use in our physics engine. Right? Whenever we are going to resume now with our course, creating our physics engine, we are going to use this Euler integration to understand and predict the position of my object as it falls, the prediction of the velocity as the acceleration is to change. This is how we're going to do. We're going to integrate our problem this way. So summary, right? Let's just put things into context and do a quick summary. Differentiation and integration. Differentiation is going down, right? So if I have the position and I want to find the rate of change, which is the velocity, I differentiate, right? Velocity is dp dt. I differentiate and I find the velocity. Knowing the velocity, I differentiate dv dt. What is the rate of change of the velocity? Is the acceleration. So differentiation is this way, right? This way down. And if I want to go the other way, if I have the acceleration, I want to find the velocity, I integrate my function, right? So I, the integration is the integration, right? So if I integrate the acceleration, I get the new velocity. If I integrate the velocity, dt, I find my new position. So this is a quick summary of what we're dealing with. Differentiation, but in our physics simulation, we have the acceleration, we want to find the new velocity. And now that we have the new velocity, we need to integrate to find the position. This is, in a nutshell, what we are dealing with with our very basic physics simulation in this discrete step-by-step -step simulation passes of our simulation loop.
right? This is what we're talking about. If you ever studied physics back in high school, elementary school, whenever we were kids, you probably remember those formulas that I'm putting there. Do you see? The position, the new position at a constant acceleration, it is P0 plus V0t, right? The start velocity times t plus acceleration times squared divided by 2. That was the formula that we used whenever we were kids to find the new position in a constant acceleration problem. And then, do you remember how to find the velocity in this constant acceleration was the V0, the velocity start, plus AT, the acceleration times time? That function right there is also very common. You probably remember from elementary school and high school. And the other way around, right? So if you integrate the acceleration, if you take the integral of this thing, you get the velocity, and this is the integral to get the position. So if you integrate the velocity to get the position, you integrate and you get position at start plus velocity start times time plus at squared divided by 2. This is how we find the position. This is how we integrate the velocity to find the position in a constant acceleration mechanics problem, right? Movement problem. So I just wanted to put things into context, right? Uh, if you really dive in into these ideas of integrating, differentiating, uh, if you go in, again, if you study calculus, you spend a lot of time, you spend an entire semester integrating this formula, and then you know how to find this one. And then you go and you differentiate that formula, you know how to find that one. So it goes both ways. We can differentiate and we can integrate our problem. This is differentiation and integration in the context of movement. And I think this is a beautiful thing. And wait, wait, before you go, remember, if you like this type of content, thumbs up, subscribe, you know, all that jazz. And if you want full feature courses, comprehensive courses on physics engines, 3D graphics, computer science, programming, mathematics, you can just go to picuma.com where I teach and you will find a selection of really nice courses about computer science, programming, mathematics, where we really go dissect and we look at the low level of what is happening with all these ideas of these beautiful ideas of physics simulations, 3D graphics, real time simulation. And I would say that if you enjoy contents like this one, you will love picuma.com. Hopefully, I'll see you there. Thank you. See you next time.